Okay, let's get started. <coughs> I promise this is the last piece that involves a little bit of mathematics, uh, but I just want to show you an interesting thing that happens often in, uh, uh, in mathematics and in algorithms design, that the same ideas that you discover them to work for one type of a problem um, can actually somehow generalize uh, um, to a seemingly unrelated uh, uh, field. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, if you take the advanced algorithms next semester, you will see that uh, a discrete Fourier transform has a continuous time counterpart called just uh, the Fourier transform. And there is an interesting duality that statements about, uh, lots of statements about the discrete Fourier transform have direct counterpart in the continuous case. Uh, even though for discrete Fourier transform we speak about finite length sequences uh, and uh, um, continuous time Fourier transform uh, speaks about uh, <coughs> real or complex valued uh, functions, right? But somehow by really, really kind of, uh, I always find it strange that these discrete uh, theorems that work for discrete case uh, have an analog in the continuous time case and vice versa. So remember the good old Karatsuba uh, trick. Um, we showed how multiplying two large numbers of size n can be reduced to just three multiplications of size n over two, right? And this is what made the algorithm faster, right? That uh, um, if you did uh, four multiplications for numbers of size n over two, you don't gain anything. But Karatsuba was clever to show that you can do it with three multiplications by forming uh, A1 uh, plus A0 times B1 plus B0, and then uh, um, getting the, all the terms he needs. If you want to multiply matrices, uh, right? If you have a matrix of size, uh, say, uh, uh, n by n, and you want to multiply it by another matrix of size n by n, the product, of course, will be also of size n by n. So the product will have n squared many entries that you have to fill, right? But to get an entry, you have to multiply a row of the first matrix with a column, find, essentially to find a, sc a scalar product between the row uh, of the first matrix and a column of the uh, second matrix, which of course takes n many multiplications. So the usual way how you would multiply matrices means that it runs in times in time n cube, because you have n squared many entries to fill. For each entry, you need n many multiplications. So in total, you, get, you would get n cube many multiplications. And that's very slow if n is large, right? If n is large, that becomes really slow. Now, an amazing thing is that uh, the same trick works, well, it's not the same trick, but similar trick works for matrices. Uh, and it's due to Van Strassen. And the idea is this. Again, you do divide and conquer. Uh, your product matrix is obtained as A times B, and you split A in four sub-matrices of size N over 2 times N over 2. So to get, uh, say, an entry in R, you would multiply A by E, and then you add B times G, right? Because multiplying the whole row AB with the whole column EG splits into two multiplications. Uh, the left part A will multiply entries in E, and then the right part, B, will multiply the entries in G. So 
Uh, if you, so this means that this R will be equal A times E plus, right, A times E plus B times G. And so forth, you can find expressions, here they are, for all four components. Now notice here, we have uh, all together how many? Four times two, eight multiplications, right? Um, and um, once you find the product A times E uh, and the products B times G, you have to add these two matrices together. And this will be, of course, because you have N over two uh, squared uh, many entries, the overhead will be quadratic. So here is the recursion formula. You reduce a multiplication of two n by n matrices into eight multiplications of n over two size matrices plus quadratic work that is necessary to add a e to b g. Right now, these are n over two times n over two matrices. They have altogether n squared divided by four entries, so you will have to do uh, quadratic many additions, right? So you get this formula and you tell me uh, what is uh, the growth rate of the solution using the master theorem. What is the kind of pivoting polynomial look like here? It is n to which power? Log with basis two of eight, right? It's log B of A. But this is a log with the, um, uh, basis two of eight is three, right? So you get that this pivoting for linomial is N cube, and of course, you can reduce it slightly and still beat this N squared. So uh, the solution to this recurrence is uh, N cube. So divide and conquer, if you do it in a naive way, in, uh, by reducing to eight multiplications, uh, doesn't help, just like uh, if you did it with four multiplications in Karadzuba. But lo and behold, then a very smart man called Van Strassen comes into, uh, um, into play, and he finds out that if you find the products of uh, these matrices, uh, then you can get all four components uh, from these products, and there are only seven products, right? Now, when we did Karatsuba, we showed that you can actually figure out what combinations to make without any, any guesswork. Uh, by simply evaluating the corresponding polynomials from minus n to n, right? <coughs> so these, the values of these polynomials for these small inputs were the guys that you had to multiply. Now, how did Van Strassen come up with these seven products? I have no slightest clue. <laughs> He was just, I guess, sufficiently brave to try quite a few combinations because before he uh, hit the jackpot. And I'm not aware of any systematic way how to come up with these seven multiplications, unlike the business with Karatsuba when all these quantities came, they, these guys were just the values of uh, the polynomials for small inputs. Now, if you reduce it to seven multiplications, then, so what is then the algorithm? Partition the two matrices into four pieces, perform the seven multiplications recursively, and then combine them, and lo and behold, the recurrence now has this form, and the critical polynomial now becomes n to the power log two of seven. Right, and this is still bigger, significantly bigger than n squared, so the solution grows as n to the log two of seven. Now, what's the difference between log two of seven and log two of eight? Well, this is approximately 281, and this might be 
seen as only slightly smaller than <clears throat> three, but actually, you see, on present-day machines, uh, if your matrices are bigger than 32 by 32, one Strassen wins over uh, direct uh, uh, computation by, uh, you know, with the cubic many. So the moral is uh, that sometimes systematic approach, uh, like with polynomial evaluations, uh, can help you uh, to avoid guesswork, but sometimes you just have to guess, right? Uh, and uh, so you should not underestimate the power of heuristics, right? Very often, even when math fails, a good heuristic can lead you to a correct solution to the annoyance of mathematicians, right? Because it's not a proper way uh, to do math if you have to do uh, guesswork. Okay, so this is more of a curiosity, but you should know that software like uh, MATLAB, in fact, di uses divide and conquer procedure to multiply matrices, and that's one of the reasons why it's uh, uh, so fast. Okay, so a few more examples of uh, divide and conquer. So here is a problem. You want to build, say this is a circuit, right? These are gates, the red uh, squares, uh, are uh, logic gates, God knows which ones, maybe some exclusive or some ands, and you want to implement this circuit that looks like a complete binary tree on the silicon. When you design a chip, what are designers always trying to minimize? The surface area, they even call it the real estate of the, of the chip, right? Because smaller surface area you use, uh, then from a buffer, a buffer you can get more uh, chips, right? So it's important to pack densely. Of course, there are constraints that uh, you should make sure that uh, different parts of the circuit do not cross talk to each other, but in general, Minimization of the surface area is of prime concern. Now, what do you think? One good aspect of such a layout is that it's very intuitive. This is how we imagine a complete binary tree. But what do you think in terms of surface area? Is this the most efficient way to design this circuit? No, why it's not? Yeah, it's kind of the circuit, that's a very good observation. As you go up, uh, there is kind of uh, uh, lots of unused space in between. Very good. But let me ask you a question. Assume that uh, I give you prescribed uh, perimeter of a rectangle. What rectangle has largest surface area one that, how do we call equilateral triangles? Square. Squares. So you see, when you want to minimize, usually the solution is uh, kind of symmetric. Um, so this is very elongated one because the length is very large. The length is linear in the number of uh, circuits, but the depth or the height uh, is only logarithmic, right? So this doesn't sound that uh, it will be the best uh, design. And in fact, this is not how you implement such circuits on the silicon. You use uh, something that is uh, called an H3 embedding. And now notice the length and the width of the circuits of the circuit is the same and it's much more uniform. As you noticed, uh, it's m the usage of, there is much less waste uh, of uh, blank space, uh, right, uh, than uh, in the previous uh, solution. So it's easy to see that now the sizes are, this will be L, say, n over four, right, and this will be n over four, 
plus a constant, this is, will be two uh, cells uh, in between, so you get that the total area is uh, uh, L of n is two times L of n over four, plus the constant, if you do it recursively, right, there is a, a, a constant addition. Uh, so uh, let's see. Uh, what is the solution of this recurrence? Uh, master theorem tells us that the polynomial is n to the power uh, log, uh, log 4 of 2, which is half. half. So um, uh, you get that theta of n is n squared, sorry, square root of n, so the surface area will be square root of n times uh, square root of n will be linear in n, and that's a much uh, better solution, right? So that's another nice example of uh, um, uh, of divide and conquer. Okay, so let's now re... Um, Gee, how do I do that? Maybe this way. Uh, okay. So now, after I get uh, some more light, um, Let's see. Now we have to use multimedia, uh, namely some chalk, right? And uh, as we progress to this, through this class, we will be using slides uh, less and less. Uh, probably I will completely revert to doing things uh, on the board uh, eventually and uh, or a kind of mix of the two uh, but you will have statements of all problems that we do on the board uh, on the slides that I will provide for you but the problem with using slides is uh, that we want to do it interactively right we, you, we design is kind of more of a skill than some kind of theory, so uh, what we are going to do is uh, we are going to use much more chalk than uh, fancy slides. Here is an interesting problem for you. Can I have your attention, please? So assume that you have a bunch of users who say a thousand users who rate movies, okay? And you want to figure out, maybe for the purpose of building a recommender system, what is the level of similarity um, between two users? How would you determine if uh, two users have similar tastes uh, or different tastes? Uh, well, first you can pick your two users that you want to measure the similarity, and you can throw out uh, the movies that they haven't, both, both of them have not seen. Okay? So then what you get is, uh, you get two lists, right? Say, this is your user A, and this is your user B, and say um, the let's enumerate the movies in the order that they appear as uh, preferences. So this guy ordered the movies. Uh, according how much he likes them. The ones that he likes the most are towards the top, and then those that he likes less and less are towards the bottom. 
So this would be movie one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way to say if they have n movies that they have both seen, right? And then what you can do is uh, for each of the movies uh, that, uh, that they have seen, you can look where the corresponding movie appears in the list for user B. So maybe, so for each movie I, right, you can look for its index in B, let's call this index uh, uh, B uh, sub I, right? And uh, so here I will appear and it will be uh, B I uh, index here. So, for example, one might be the, in the third place here, right? Here is one. And on the other hand, four here might be the movie that um, B liked the best. And assume you connect all of the pairs. So you find where is three here, you connect three with three. Uh, you found four, you look for five, and so forth. What is a good measure? When will you say that these guys have a similar taste? When they are identical. That, well, <laughs> um, right? Uh, if you know, if you pick any two people, I would uh, be shocked if they can agree about everything uh, uh, completely. But how would you, what would be the degree of similarity? Yes? You measure the distance that each movie will have in the to do. Okay, that would be, what is kind of uh, quick and uh, simple if you look at this picture? What's the difference between, say, this and that, and the difference between one and four? What indicates difference of opinion? The crossing, the crossing right? So if, when they don't cross, it means they appear in the same order. If they are out of order, if A preferred one to four, but B preferred four to one, obviously they disagree which one is better, so it indicates difference. So then the degree of similarity can be just the number, let's call it uh, number of inversions, right? Because one is uh, smaller than four, but four appears before one. Inversion is if I is smaller than J, uh, and, uh, but bi is larger than bj, right? What does this mean? This means that bi appears after bj, even though the first guy put i before uh, j. So we call this an inversion. Right? So then, um, what is the maximal number of inversions that we might have? It is if, so inversions are any pairs, notice, uh, this is for any pairs of the movies. Exactly, this is just n chooses two, right, which is n n minus one divided by two, which happens precisely when B goes exactly in opposite order than A. So in principle, the number of inversions can be quadratic. How would you count the number of inversions? Well, the simplest way is to go through all pairs, right? This is how many pairs you can have, you go through all pairs and you look whether their indices are inverted in B. This would take 
this many, precisely this many comparisons. Now, the beautiful trick is that you can do it in time uh, theta of n log n, right? So why is this interesting? It's interesting that you can actually get the number of inversions without testing each pair. So somehow we have to do some trick that from each step you get more information than just about one pair. And the trick to do that is divide and conquer. And uh, what I like very much about this example, which is, by the way, in your textbook, Kleinberg and uh, um, I keep forgetting the other title, uh, name, Clar Kleinberg and Tardos, right? Uh, Eva Tardos. So uh, it's because you actually know the algorithm to do that in time n log n, it requires only a tiny little tweak. And the algorithm is the merge sort, right? So to determine the number of inversions, right, we will do the following. We take our RA B and we split it into two, right? So equal parts, right? Let's call this will be um, a part C and this will be part, uh, well, this will be, uh, say, uh, low part and uh, high part, right? These will be guys with larger indices. Here indices go from n over 2 plus 1 all the way to n. And here indices go from 1 to n over 2, the last one, right? Okay, so we will split the array into two. Then what we are going to do is calling the very same algorithm that I'm just describing, right? We will recursively apply it. So apply, and the algorithm is usually called, um, how is it called? I think sort and count. Uh, to uh, L and H, right? So the output of the algorithm will be two things. It will be sorted sub-arrays plus the number of inversions I of L and number of inversions i of h. Okay, so we can look how many numbers are such that i is less than uh, j, right? Um, but uh, sorry, so this is j, and this is i. So i is uh, less than j. But the index, uh, which is uh, B, uh, how did we call it, BI, is bigger than BJ, because I ended up with the index BI, and J ended with the index VJ, and it precedes. Uh, J came before in this array, if you look, J precedes I. So say if I is uh, uh, 3 and J is uh, 7, you see 3 is smaller than 7, right? But uh, um, 3 comes later, after 7, right? So this is, these are these two numbers. In order to now complete the case for the whole array of length n, 
we have to do the following. What is the total number of inversions here? Well, it will be inversions that happen in low part plus inversions that happen in the high part plus put together plus inversions that happen cross border, right? So that this guy is smaller than that guy, right? But its index obviously is larger than the index of this guy. Are you with me? Right? How do we do that? So notice after we sort this array, we messed up. You can no longer see the inversions here because these guys are all in sorted order, but we recorded the number of inversions, right? So these two guys are now sorted in an increasing order, and so are these guys. So this is our L and our H. What we have to do now to find the solution uh, for n, right? We have to sort now the two sub, uh, the join, uh, joining these two arrays, uh, and we have to find the number of inversions, which we know that they are inversions of the L plus inversions in H, right? Plus inversions uh, of uh, uh, across, let me put it like this, uh, inversions across LH. So these are inversions when a smaller number, I hope you can see this, smaller number belongs to uh, H and larger number uh, belongs to L, right? So we know these, these two quantities, we can just add them up, but we have to now count how many inversions happen right, when uh, the larger number is here, so here is j, and uh, here is i, and uh, j is uh, bigger than i, but of course, because this is the higher part, index, uh, um, so index of uh, uh, B, J will be smaller than index B, I, simply because uh, the smaller number is here and the larger number is here. Now, how do we obtain a sorted array if we are merging two sorted arrays? Well, we simply look for the smallest element here and smallest element here, and then we move uh, the smallest element into this array, right? Then we delete this element and again consider smallest element here, smallest element here, whichever is smaller, we move it into this array, right? And this will work just as before, but now, as we are doing it, we have to account how many inversions happen when the smaller element is in I and the uh, uh, larger, sorry, smaller element is in upper part and the larger element is in the lower part. Now, Let's see, if I um, move, uh, if say the smaller element is uh, from here, 
in the lower part, uh, or say, sorry, let me consider first the other case. If uh, the smaller element happens to be, um, which, one, which one shall we, let me now not mess it up. So when can an inversion happen? Inversion can happen if the smallest, smaller, sorry, if the larger elements precedes the smaller element and the smaller element uh, is uh, uh, from here, right? No, when the smaller element is an H, then we need to do inversion. So if the, exactly, so what did I say? <laughs> did I say it opposite? Yes. Oh, gosh. Okay, so if the smaller element uh, is in uh, H, right, then we are guaranteed to have inversion with all the elements uh, that are here, right? So all what we have to do is uh, when we move the smaller element uh, from the upper part, uh, we have to add uh, um, all the, the total number of elements left in this part uh, because each element here will be uh, in the, will cause an inversion, right? Okay, so um, this is really a, uh, so think about this at home and I will write up uh, the solution and include it as, uh, as a slide. So the idea in divide and conquer is uh, you can assume recursively to have computed the elements the number of inversions here and the number of inversions here, but then to count inversions that are across. The order of elements here doesn't matter and the order of elements here doesn't matter. So you might as well sort them. But if you sort them, then you immediately know if, uh, I, uh, uh, if a smaller element, right, uh, will appear after, uh, a, uh, uh, after a larger element because, right, if I move uh, this element here, then from the left, all elements from the left will come after this element, of course, and then they constitute, in fact, an inversion. Okay. So... What is the runtime? Obviously, uh, the same recurrence holds, right? Because T of n will be still equal to times T of n over 2, plus the merging and counting is all doable in O of n. And so T of n will be O of n log n. Okay, so this is, these are just a few examples of nice divide uh, and conquer um, algorithms. So the next topic of our study will be the greedy algorithms. Okay, so what we are going to do uh, there will be very little theory coming uh, along, uh, maybe a little bit when we do max flow. Uh, the rest, what we are going to do, will be just problems. And problems will be listed on slides, uh, but uh, we will work on the problems together to, um, uh, to kind of pick up the design skills. Okay, so let me, do we have time to start greedy? Uh, not really, so let's stop here and we do it um, next week. <laughs>